But we're back in, we're looking at the life of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, and how we view Jesus shapes how we live for Jesus. You've, heard, you've all heard me say this countless times over the past few months. Your life imitates your theology. What you believe about God impacts greatly how you live for God, how you share Christ, and so on. So today we're looking at a very important story in the Gospel of Mark, um, a very deep story and one that not a lot of people rush to preach about for obvious reasons. And so we're just going to dive right in this morning, beginning in verse 1. The story goes all the way to verse 20, but we're just going to stop at verse 13 this week and pick it up next week as well. It begins, they came to the other side of the sea to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him. And he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name? He asked him. My name is Legion, he answered him, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. A large herd of pigs was there, feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down to the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, the parallel passages in the other Gospels are Matthew 8, 28-34 and Luke 8, 26-39. When it comes to stories like this, we have to remember that there are certain extremes we can go to, and we have to be very careful not to do those things. But what we are seeing here in this story, again, if you're taking notes, you may want to write this down, is one of the themes that Mark has re uh, repeatedly drilled into his readers, that Christ came to conquer the kingdom of Satan. And it is only through Christ his followers may do the same. I'll say that again. Christ came to conquer the kingdom of Satan, and it is only through Christ his followers may do the same. Again, we have to be careful with this story. We don't want to dive into speculation or unhealthy obsessions, and we don't want to deny the truth of what's happening either. In fact, C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, he writes, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist and a magician with the same delight. When it, gets, when it comes to demons, angels, the, the, the paranormal things of Scripture, most of what gets taught is simply speculation. It's based on experiences. It's things that have happened to somebody and then they wrote a book and they shared it. In fact, the, probably some of the, the deepest books you'll read on, on demons or angels come from a guy by the name of Michael Heiser. And I like Dr. Heiser. Some of the stuff he says is pretty interesting. But again, he does not draw the bulk of his material from Scripture. In fact, he goes to the Dead Sea Scrolls and and extra-biblical texts like the book of Enoch. There's Some of you have probably heard of a man by the name of Merrill Unger. Merrill Unger is a, is a brilliant mind, brilliant scholar. And he writes about demonology 
from one side of the spectrum. And then a guy by the name of Derek Prince came along and he writes from the other side of the spectrum. And they're both uh, at polar opposite ends. But when it comes to angels and demons and things of that nature, the Christian must not have an unhealthy obsession. Scripture is quiet on most of these things for a reason. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us the hidden things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us. In other words, there are some things we don't need to know. There are some things we shouldn't get obsessed about. Kind of like the Song of Solomon. How many of you have ever, show of hands, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on the Song of Solomon and you were satisfied with what, what was said? Maybe one or two of you? Okay. Jennifer and I, when we were looking for a church home, when we first moved to Bismarck, we went to this church, and this guy was preaching out of the Song of Solomon, and it was incredibly inappropriate. Not at all the way Scripture intends us to read. It was very crass, very crude, borderline pornographic. It was, it was dirty in every possible way, and that's what some do with certain passages of Scripture, and so we have to be careful not to do something of that nature, even when it comes to this. When we look at our Bibles, it's fun to speculate. It's fun to chase rabbit trails, sure. But we have to deal with what the text actually says at some point, what it makes clear, and that alone is enough for us. In today's message, demons, just like the storm a couple of weeks ago, are not really the focus of this passage. Jesus Christ is. So I'd ask you to take today what you what you've been told, what you've been taught about demons and angels and things of that nature, take it and just set it aside today. Things about unclean spirits and, and ranks of demons, all that stuff, if you've ever heard that, that stuff, just set it aside and ask ourselves today, what does this scripture really tell us about Christ, about who he is? Because we'll come to the same conclusion that Christ came to conquer the kingdom of Satan and it is only through Christ his followers will ever be able to do the same. First of all, we see Christ came to confront. The story begins back in verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Now, there's a few things we have to understand here. This continues the narrative from a few weeks ago when Jesus calms the storms. Now, if you've attended class on Wednesday nights, you know that around the 1500s, chapters were actually added to your Bible. Prior to that, there were no big numbers. There were no little numbers. The little numbers, the verses, were actually added a little while later. So there's no skipping in the story for Mark here as he tells the story of Jesus calming the storm and now going into the country of the Gerasenes. There's no break, okay? It just, he goes right on into this. We saw Jesus in that story as master over the winds and waves, over nature itself. Now we're going to see Jesus confront the kingdom of Satan, in a way that has not been done since God himself cast the enemy out of heaven with a third of his angels. He cast out demons prior to this. We saw that. We saw in chapters 1 and 3, as Jesus healed the sick, the lame, the leprous, he also cast out demons. But there is something incredibly unique about his interaction with the Gerasene demoniac. This is the greatest confrontation between Christ and and the enemy that we will see, save only what takes place in the book of Revelation sometime after this. When Jesus faces that great dragon and Satan's bound for a thousand years and then ultimately cast in the lake of fire for all eternity. Now the three synoptic gospels that include this story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Mark gives us the clearest picture. He details the most stuff or most things within his narrative. And he tells us this takes place in the country of the Gerasenes. Now Matthew, if you you read Matthew, Matthew comes from a different angle. He doesn't have it taking place in the the country of the Gerasenes, but of the Gadarenes. Now both of these areas were in an area called the Decapolis. Decapolis means the ten cities. And it's likely when Matthew writes his, he's not contradicting Mark. He's just saying it's in the similar area, same area, and... It's the one that his audience would have been most familiar with. They're all in that same little kind of cluster of cities. Matthew also mentions two demoniacs, while both Mark and Luke only mention one. 
And that's likely because Mark and Luke focus on the one that was the more prominent. The second man, of course, not insignificant, but just not as well known as this man from the Gerasenes area. Regardless, this is an incredible interaction for Jesus in our text. And we read on in verse 2, As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. Now, if you remember, Jesus, after in chapter 4, towards the end, he had this very urgent need to go across the Sea of Galilee. In fact, if you remember, the Greek was, we got to go now, basically, is what he tells the disciples. Because he has an appointment, right? And I, I likened it to in John chapter 4, when Jesus had to go through Samaria, when in fact he didn't really have to go through, but Jesus had a divine appointment at the, at the well with the woman, we call the woman at the well, still don't know her name, but he has a fight scheduled. Jesus isn't ready to back down. He's not going to. He has a confrontation waiting for him. I mean, Jesus is no coward. In fact, that's something to remember. Our king is not weak. He's not some hippie type of savior walking on eggshells as he travels through Israel. In Scripture, Jesus is never the one who gets afraid. He instills fear. His miracle of calming the storm terrified the disciples at the end of chapter 4. And if you think the disciples were afraid of the storm, it says they were even more terrified of Jesus by the time it was over. But now they get out of this boat, and here comes this wild man running at them, likely screaming his head off. You think they weren't a little bit intimidated? But Jesus is not. Jesus stands his ground. He doesn't flinch. This is what he came for. He's ready. Scripture affirms this again and again, that Jesus came for this type of confrontation. 1 John 3, 8, The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Colossians 2, 15, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. John 12, 31, Now is the judgment of, the, of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Satan's fall began when Mary gave birth in Bethlehem. That's when it started. That was the fulfillment of the prophecy of what God had told the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 when he said, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That began in the nativity. And now, one of the many battles between the two sides is about to take place in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' feet strike dry land, and this man from the tombs, led by his captors, directed by his demons, dragged forth by the sheer will of these unclean spirits who have defiled him for so long, they, whether they intended to or not, take him to the one person who can set this man free from their grasp. The unclean spirit is another way of Referring to the demon, by the way, such spiritual filth as they were, they themselves were morally grotesque. They caused harm for the people they possessed. We see that in our text. But yet this man comes towards Jesus. He doesn't walk, he runs. And Mark goes on to describe a little background for him in verses 3 and 4. He lived in the tombs and no one was able to restrain him anymore not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. From out of the tombs, this man comes, out of the graves. If he were a Jewish man, this is a great insult to his heritage. He'd be around dead bodies. This would be a great disgrace He's so unclean, like the spirits that possess him, he has been defiled. He's an outcast. We don't know that he's a Jewish man. He could be a Gentile. He likely was, as the area was prominently a, a Gentile area. But he was an outcast. He lived in the tombs. The tombs were burial chambers that were outside of the town. They were carved out of the rock and the uninhabited hillsides. Nobody wanted to be around this man. No one would dare to tame him. In fact, the word for subdue in the Greek is damasai, and it means to tame or to control. Nobody was strong enough 
to tame him. Even with chains and ropes, bindings and fetters, they were not able to pin this man down and keep him down long enough to keep him from harming himself or others. In fact, Mark says, no one was strong enough to subdue him. And that's a very interesting choice of words if you remember Mark chapter 3. When Jesus says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. And Jesus was talking in that scenario about exorcisms. He's saying you can't cast a demon out unless you appeal to one who is stronger than that demon. And here comes Jesus, the one who is stronger than a legion of demons. No one can tie up this strong man. No one can subdue him. No one can free him from this bondage. But look at his torment. Night and day, the tombs, among the tombs and the mountains, he's crying out and cutting himself with stones. This man is living in abject terror. And he's causing terror for anyone around him. He is unwell. He is enslaved. He is, in a word, scary. His torment is also the torment of those who knew him. Can you imagine the embarrassment he has become to his family? His mother, his brother, his sisters, his father. They want to distance themselves from him as much as possible, just as anyone else would want to. Can you imagine if this man had a wife and children, the legacy that he's leaving for them? And his, his screams would have echoed into the village night and day. He is a constant reminder. His screams are a constant reminder that there is a wild man, a beast of a man, a perversion of what mankind was to be living outside the city. With all of that said, he's also a beacon for the kingdom of Satan. He's a constant reminder that if the enemy can do this to one man, what could he do to the entire village? He cuts himself with rocks, likely sharpened flint. He's a danger to himself. He is a danger to anyone that might come within arm's reach. In fact, we've seen this elsewhere in Scripture. There's a story in the book of Acts, Acts 19, about seven sons of this high priest named Sceva. And they get in their head, they don't want to submit their life to Christ, but they want the power of Christ. So they go around and they're trying to cast out demons, and they say something along the lines of, I adjure you or I, I cast you out in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. One day the demons have enough in Acts 19.15. The evil spirit answers them, says, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who are you? And then he proceeds to beat them, strip them, chase them outside the house, naked and bloody. Do you think this man from the tombs would do anything different if he were given the chance to anyone else? What do you think he has done to people who've tried to subdue him? They've learned their lesson. No one is strong enough anymore to tie this man down with chains or ropes. He's a, he's a thing best kept away from the rest of society because society is terrified of him. Just imagine, if you will, the disciples' faces as they see this man running, sprinting towards Jesus. They don't even know who Jesus is, right? Who is this man? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Those words were just on their lips. And now here comes this guy, and the, the disciples are likely backing up. Whoa, what's going to happen? And Jesus stands his ground. Confrontation is about to take place, and Jesus knows he didn't come here to lose. He came here to conquer. He came to command. And that's the second point this morning. We read on in verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him. Now again, the disciples have struggled with trying to understand exactly who Jesus is, but the demons always seem to know right away. So the man runs down and he hits his knees before Jesus. In fact, he takes upon him the posture of a beggar, of someone who is about to plead for mercy. Someone who is in complete submission in the presence of someone who could utterly destroy them. When I read this text and I was building a sermon, I, I thought of this time, Jennifer and I had this 
dog we bought at a pet store named Safari Pets in Indianapolis. He was a boxer. So if you know anything about dogs, boxers are by nature the goofiest animals God ever made. And he had some issues. We couldn't figure out why. We took him to a puppy class, and the lady said, well, this dog's been abused. We'd only had him for a few days, so it wasn't us. But I took him back to Safari Pets one day, and one of the workers walked by as if he was going to stop and pet him. And Jack, our boxer, rolled over on his back in an act of submission while I'm standing there and evacuates his bladder all over the floor. That's a sign of a submission. That's something that a dog who's been beat one time too many, that's what they do. Jack was a very pathetic dog for a lot of reasons, but that's a big one. He was abused. He was beaten. And he showed a sign of submission. And in a similar way, that's what this man is doing as he comes into the presence of Christ. He's showing his belly. Who would these demons look to? As Jack looked at me, don't let him get me, was the the expression on his face. Who are the demons going to look at? Who's this man to look to? If, If they're terrified in the presence of this other man, this Jewish carpenter rabbi figure, who are they going to look to for assurance and protection? No one. In fact, the confrontation is over before it even begins. They're on their knees and they're prepared to beg and beg they do. Verses 7 and 8, he cried out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Now when the man cries out, not just his voice, in fact, the Greek says it's phone megalon lege, and it's at the top of his voice. It's an inhuman, high-pitched sound that comes out of him. This is the type of being that Jude speaks of in verse 6 of his short epistle. The angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling. John also mentions these types of creatures in Revelation 20 verse 10. The devil who deceived them was thrown to the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that's an important passage for this text today because that's what this man is afraid is about to happen. Not just the man speaking, it's the demons speaking through him. And what he says, or what the demons say, basically is, what do you have to do with me? And literally what he's saying is, what is it to me and you? And really this is a Hebrew idiom that says, your agenda and my agenda are two totally different things here. So what are you doing here? Why must there be a conflict? That's really the basis of what he's saying. In fact, we actually see this in the Old Testament when the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh in, in the book of Joshua, they get together on the other side of the Jordan and they build this big, beautiful altar to God, but the rest of Israel thinks they're doing this as a form of idol worship. So they send the priest Phinehas down to investigate. And he gets there and they say to him, may the Lord himself hold us accountable if we intended to offer burnt offerings and grain offerings on it, or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it. We actually did this from a specific concern that in the future your descendants might say to our descendants, what relationship do you have with the Lord, the God of Israel? In other words, the Hebrew seems to say, if your descendants and and our descendants come together and they say, well, you have nothing in common with me. You're on the other side of the Jordan. We have no relationship with one another. It's what the demon is getting at here we don't have anything to do with each other jesus why are you here we see the same thing used with jephthah and the king of the ammonites jephthah sent messengers to the king of the ammonites this is in judges 11 he asked he says what do you have against me that you've come to fight me in my land in other words what is it to you and me that we have this battle why do we got to fight we don't have anything in common we have no relation with one another so when this demoniac approaches jesus in a sense what he's saying is Obviously, your agenda is totally different from mine. So what could you possibly want with me? What could I possibly want with you unless you're here to destroy me? And then the demon does something fascinating. Throughout the entire Gospel of Mark, this, this, these demons will address Jesus by the longest title he's given in the entire Gospel of Mark. He says, 
He calls him Jesus, Son of the Most High God. This is a messianic title. Other demons had called him the Son of God. If you remember in chapter 3, verse 11, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the Son of God. But here, this demon says, you are the Son of the Most High God. And it's distinguishing him as the Son of Yahweh, the God of Israel, the Jewish Most High God. This is the term Gentiles would use in Scripture to describe the God of Israel. We see it in Genesis. Melchizedek, the uh, priestly king of Salem, refers to God as that. In Genesis 14, 18-24, if you're taking notes. But we also see it in a very interesting place. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14 says, I will ascend above the high clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Well, who says that? Now, technically, in the Scripture, it's the king of Babylon. This is a rebuke to the king of Babylon, but church history and and church tradition holds to the fact that this was actually a a double meaning referencing the the attempted coup of Satan in heaven. I won't read the whole passage, but it goes back to verse 12. It says, Shining morning star, how you have fallen from the heavens, you destroyer of men. You have been cut down to the ground. You, you, You said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set up my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you will be brought down to Sheol in the deepest regions of the pit. And we see that demise in Revelation 20 that I already mentioned. He's tossed in the lake of fire for all eternity. And now Jesus has come to this man And he's told the unclean spirit to come out. The demon doesn't budge. Instead, he screams and casts himself before Jesus, begging him not to cast him out in torment. In fact, Matthew's verse, his parallel verse, says, Suddenly they shouted, What do you have to do with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? And Mark adds a little phrase. It says, I beg you before God. God. It's as if the demon is appealing to God's sovereignty to try and soften Jesus' mood. Don't, I, I'm going to appeal to your father and say, please don't hit me so hard. These demons that possess the garrison man are terrified now. Jesus has arrived on the scene. They are scared that he is going to cast them into the lake of fire before they're ready to go. Newsflash, they're not going to be ready to go when their time comes anyway. They're likely confused. These demons who have caused confusion, they've caused terror, they've caused fear, are now the ones who are afraid because the stronger person is there. Theirs is a kingdom of darkness, secrets, lies, and deceit. And Jesus Christ shows up, the only person worthy of being called good, the only one worth being described as light and love. And in that presence, they feel a very terrified fear. So they who would possess this man and use him to strike fear in the townspeople who mutilated his body, who tormented and oppressed the beings that once dominated are now begging like dogs. And Jesus responds, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion because we are many. Now, a lot has been made about this passage, this exchange. In fact, if you have ever read a book on demonology or or angels and demons, it's likely you've come across an author who has said, you've got to do this. You need to do this. Well, this is the only time in Scripture we see anyone doing this. So it's not necessarily setting the The trend here, you do not always have to do this. Jesus doesn't do this. We don't see Paul doing that in Acts 16, 18 when he casts a demon out. Only Jesus seems to do this. So we have to ask, what's the purpose of that? Now, there is a belief in the first century that if you knew something's true name, you could hold a power over it. But actually, that's witchcraft. That's magic. That's not Christianity. It has nothing to do with Scripture. Jesus was sovereign. He did not need to know who this demon was. He already knew. 
So we begin to wrestle with this. Why, why does he give the demons more press than they deserve? Well, what he's doing here is actually very simple. He poses this question to bring to reality the complexity of this man's situation, to bring to light that it's not just a mental illness. There is something else at work within this man's mind, within his body. And they call themselves a legion. This is a Latin phrase that both Jews and Greeks would have been very familiar with. It actually would have referred to a Roman uh, battalion of about 5,000 to 6,000 troops. Depending on who you read, it could be as few as five, as many as 6,000 troops. So what the demon is saying here, what he's suggesting, is that there is a large number of militant fighting demons within this man. And they are begging. And he reiterates the expression with, we are many. Verse 10, and he begged. These soldier demons are now beggars in the presence of Christ. And he begs them earnestly not to send them out of the region. He understands, these demons understand that Jesus had and still has all the power to destroy them so they plead. Don't send us out of the region. Now, this does not mean they are some kind of territorial spirit. That's not what's going on here. There's not some imaginary boundary that these demons have set up, and if they go too far, it hurts them or anything like that. No, what's going on when they say that, these demons have put in a lot of work in this area. They have exercised their evil powers here. They found this place to be hospitable to their kind. People tolerate them. If you think about it, they could have called for a Jewish exorcist at any time to come and take care of this man. But they put up with the screaming. They put up with the bellowing that came from the graveyard. Why? You know, just don't mess with that. Let's tolerate it. In Luke's gospel, it says, they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. They don't want to leave where they've put down their roots. Like so many people, they like where they are. They've been comfortable where they are. It's familiar. And this abyss would be their final judgment where all the unrighteous are placed. So they beg and they plead when they're confronted by Christ. You know, the minute Jesus set foot on Gerasene soil, their days of dominating this man in the hillside were over. They were done. And so they begged to stay within their own little kingdom. Unfortunately for them, it's a kingdom conquered by Christ. Verse 11 says, A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. Now, let's be very blunt, very real for a minute. There's some weird stuff in the Bible, right? Everybody's nodding their heads. Okay, yeah, we agree on that. And this is one of those passages, I guarantee you, when you first read it, you went, huh, moving on, <laughs> right? Because that's what you do. This is a hard thing to understand. And maybe you were like, hey, hold on a second. Those pigs never hurt anybody. That's a lot of wasted bacon, right? But there's a reason to this. There's actually wisdom to what Jesus is going to do. Pigs are unclean animals to the Jewish people. So they were likely either tended by Gentiles, which is most likely because it's a Gentile region, or they were tended to by Jewish people who did not care about the Jewish law. In either case, they're not going to know who the Messiah is. They're not going to care about who the Messiah is necessarily. They're going to need some extra evidence as to who he is and what he's capable of if they're to accept him. And let's be clear, this is a large herd, and we're going to see how large. And they, The demons beg him, send us to the pigs that we may enter them. Now, again, we do not get our theology from other people's experiences, but I want to share with you something this morning. This sort of thing does apparently happen in exorcisms. And I, I uh, 
learned this from a professor of mine. Many of you know him. Um, he has preached here. I'm not going to say his name just out of respect to him, but not much of a joking guy. And when I was in Sri Lanka on my internship, I, I witnessed a young lady having a demon cast out of her. In fact, I was praying at the altar. I got up and I saw this thing happening and something in my very soul was stirred. And I asked the president, pa- uh, President Pastor Willie was his name, to Pastor Willie, what's, what's going on over there? And just as if you were to say, I'm buying toilet paper, he said, oh, they're casting out a demon. This is very normal in Sri Lanka, right? Well, fast forward a few months, and I'm back at Trinity, and, and it's the fall of my junior year, and I get the same feeling as this young lady goes forward to pray at an altar call at a Wednesday night service. And pretty soon a professor runs up, and then another professor, and another professor. And when it was over, I, I caught one of those professors, and this is the one I'm talking about. And he's, I said, uh, was that demonic? He said, well, Jeff, what do you think? I said, yeah, I, th- I think it was. And that's where he began to teach me about the, the spiritual gift of uh, discernment of spirits. You know, in the world, the secular world, people have discernment. In the church, we need to have discernment of spirits. 1 John 4.4, 4, we don't believe every spirit, right? And so he began to teach me privately, giving me lessons about spiritual warfare and, and these types of matters. And He gave me the next day in his office a stack of papers about that thick of just different authors and writers. He said, read this and then then come talk to me. And so I came to him and one of the stories in there was a similar story. A man had had been called to a house and cast a demon out. The demon had begged to go into the, the family dog. And I said, that doesn't really happen, right? He said, no, it does. Absolutely it does. But you don't give the demon permission to do that. I said, well, I mean, have you ever had that happen? And what I found out was actually this man had experienced several of these things as he worked on the Native American reservations and had done some really deep inner city missions as well. He said, yeah, actually, in the same chair I was sitting in, a few years prior to my coming on the campus, a young lady manifested a demon and she was possessed. And and he said another professor came in and began to pray with him. And the demon began, he's a deer hunter and he has a mounted buck on his wall, and he said the demon began to ask to go into the buck. Now keep in mind, this is a very serious professor. He's, he's telling me a true story. I said, but what'd you do? And he goes, well, and my eyes got huge, just waiting on this deer to go, blah, 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 you know, and he, he starts to laugh. He says, no, I told it to leave the area. It's not welcomed here. But it does apparently happen. But we don't allow it to do that. Jesus did it for a very important reason, and we'll get to why. Unclean spirits want to go into unclean animals. We don't see demons do this anywhere else in Scripture. And again, we don't see anyone ever allow demons to do this anywhere else in Scripture. So it's not the norm. And yet Jesus permits these demons to enter the pigs. We see as we go on in verse 13, he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. Now you have to remember these demons were built, they were bent on destruction. They have hurt this man. They have caused him to cut himself and live amongst the tombs. Now we know that a Roman legion is about five to 6,000 army men, right, and Roman infantrymen. And there's about, Mark says, about 2,000 pigs that these emissaries of Satan now rush in and possess, and they drown in the Sea of Galilee. Pigs die, not the demons. You can say, oh, those poor pigs. But we have to ask first, why did the demons react this way? Because in simply, they are, they are of Satan. Their nature is one of destruction. Their nature is one of terror and harm. That's why Jesus said in John 10.10, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And that's what these demons want to do. Peter says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Why? Because he wants to destroy. He wants to cause harm. All the enemy has ever wanted to do to this man is destroy him. 
He wants to destroy you. He wants to fool you into thinking otherwise, but he wants nothing more than to bring the kingdom of God to its knees. But you can't. But he can bring the child of God to theirs. You'd think he'd learn that's the position we pray from, right? This demon has possessed this man, and had they known that Jesus was coming, these demons, they would have had this man bash his head in against the rock cone tombs that he'd lived in. Make no mistake about this. Why do they hate humanity so much? Why are they so vile, so venomous towards us? Because God so loves. Because God loves you so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you want to hurt somebody more, you don't hurt them directly. You hurt the people, the things they love. God loves the world so deeply, so passionately, so sacrificially. It should be no shock to us that demons and the enemy want to hurt him by hurting, maiming, killing, destroying us. Second, we have to ask, why did Jesus allow them to go into the pigs? Ah, this is where we get to the interesting thing. It doesn't make sense at first, right? Now, why, why does it happen this way? Now, if I'm God, if I'm Jesus, I'm not letting these demons do a simple thing. I'm throwing them into the fiery furnace. I'm done with them, right? But he never asked me for my opinion on these things. That Jesus shows vast wisdom here. What he is doing is giving evidence to this man and to the people around. Again, this was not a mental health issue. This was not a mental illness. This was a man who was possessed by evil spirits. This isn't a political statement, which some one commentator suggested it might have been. This is a genuine spiritual battle and the skeletons of the pigs that will wash up on the shore for weeks to come are a testimony to that. This man, we're going to see next week, he's going to be in his right mind. And it's going to shock the people of the town. But he's going to finally understand that those demons who at some point in his life convinced him they were on his side, convinced him they had, the, the, they had his best interests at heart, that in a moment they would have gladly done to him what they did to those pigs. Third, what does this tell us? It reinforces the truth that God is willing that not any human, anyone made in his image, the Imago Dei, that he is not willing that they perish. He's patient with you and me, not wanting any to perish, but to all to come to repentance. That's what Peter wrote, 2 Peter 3, 9. And you may be here today, and you may be tormented by a sin. Maybe not tormented by a demon. I hope you're not. If you're watching online. But you may be a victim of habitual sin. You may be a victim of bitterness, of hurt, anger that you carry with you as if you're the one drinking the poison, waiting on the other person to die. Paul writes to the Ephesians, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Now one translation says, don't give the devil a foothold. Many people think that, that it just stops with anger. That anger is the only thing that can... Let the devil have an entryway into your life. That's not true. Paul goes on. He lists not stealing. Stealing begins with covetousness, with wanting, jealousy. He says, don't even let foul language come out of your mouth. And he concludes with, let all bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you, along with all malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Your sin does not mean you're demon-possessed. But don't give the enemy one foot, one inch of territory within your life, within your mind, within your heart, within your soul. He wants nothing more than to do to us what he did to those pigs. If you are in Christ, he is under your feet. He is undone. He knows this, but he doesn't want you to believe it. I'm going to move to close in just a minute. But if you're here and maybe you're struggling Maybe there's a sin that has dominated your life. Maybe there's worry. Maybe there's anxiety. There are things that you've been clinging to that are not Christ. They're not from Christ and they're not for Christ. We cannot say, Jesus, take all of my life, but not that part. 
And so today, if you're here, you would like to come and pray at the altar, you're welcome to at, at the steps. We call this area the altar. The prayer team would be happy to pray with you. If you want to pray where you are, if you'd like someone to pray with you, just motion to one of the prayer team as they come forward. But do not leave here nursing a sin that will give the enemy a foothold within your life. If nothing else, he will use it to make you feel guilty. He will use it to beat you over the head with. Ah, you're wanting to raise your hands in worship. Do you remember how you lied to your boss the other day and told him you were going to go to the doctor when you really went fishing? (laughs) That's a very mild example, of course. But he loves to do that stuff. The enemy has no place in the life of the follower of Christ. In fact, John says, you are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You have in Christ a victory over your sin. So this morning, if you would like, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. We're going to close in prayer. And I know if If you want to head on downstairs and grab something to eat, maybe you're in a hurry, that's fine. If you want to go on down and take the fellowship on downstairs, we're going to have just a moment here this morning for for prayer. And again, if you need prayer, if you'd like someone to pray with you, don't be afraid to ask someone. Father God, this morning, in the name of Jesus, those who are under the influence of the enemy, if the enemy is attacking them, We rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe we are set free from the shackles. We are set free from the chains the enemy would keep upon us. And if there's anyone here today and they're struggling with a habitual sin, if there's there's a, a, a hidden sin, a skeleton in a closet, today, Father God, I pray they repent. I pray that we confess our sins and that you forgive us, Father God, and that we are able to move forward. Lord, if that's that's anyone here, I pray they find their time on their knees before you, the same as this man who was begging. Whether he realized it or not, he was begging for freedom. The demons may have been been doing the talking, but the man was pleading with Jesus, set me free. Father, we ask you today, for those who need to be set free. That they find that freedom in you. We ask this in the name of our risen King and conqueror Jesus. Amen.